I wish to acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples, upon whose ancestral lands I collected most, if not all, of the footage for this project. The word freedom suggests an implicit sense of spatiality, that is, communicative acts of agency and self-governance can only occur within the appropriate environmental contexts. We humans exist and interact with each other in landscapes of built spaces that shape, condition, and mediate our behaviors. Stated simply, our buildings fashion our politics. Allowing that every interaction between two or more people entails a moment of politics, this video essay will examine various forms of common built space. After identifying how these spaces predetermine human behavior and thus configure acceptable forms of political expression, we shall inspect some attending theories. Ultimately, this project intends to provide awareness and a partial solution to how our fabricated landscapes tacitly place limits on our freedoms and political autonomy. International airports typify the realization of behavioral determinism. The design intent of an airport is to direct and enforce the movement of passengers whilst providing the sensation of reassurance. Sweeping beams and arching girders lift the eye, lending an impression of graceful, effortless upness. Many of the spatial forms recapitulate the contours of an aircraft, suggestive of a fuselage or gliding aerofoil. This apparent airiness disguises the actual design intent, which, when inspected, allows for very few choices. The squeezing apertures of security processing induce a physiological response in all travelers, imposing a mechanical articulation of discipline and surveillance. Here, authority is claimed. By the time passengers are on the plane, their identity has been shocked by an external locus of control, and they are docile and compliant to the degree that they have difficulty even talking to one another. Recall the relief you felt when you disembarked or deplaned at your destination, how arrived you are in that moment, how envious the departing passengers seem when you breeze past them to claim your baggage. One word given to describe this type of space is sociofugal, meaning that here people are flung away from each other. Elevators are another tool of political segregation. The lofty new construction techniques afforded by the use of steel a byproduct of the railroad industry, elevators made skyscrapers a practical reality. More so, they rearranged the representation of power. Before elevators, the most prestigious territory of a building was on the lower floors, implying that the tenants were too important to exert themselves on stairs. Areas of production were often located on the upper levels of buildings. Elevators reversed this distinction, sending the bosses to the top and the political economy away from the street. Technology transfers authority. Manuel Castells claims that in the network society, a fundamental form of social domination is the prevalence of the logic of the space of flows over the space of places. But does this not have precedent? Cathedrals were constructed to affect physiological response in massed groups of people. The synesthetic impressions of dizzying masonry, chest thrumming acoustics, and rich color spectrums of light were intended to induce a transposition of sensory perception, emerging in the congregation as a shared euphoria, whilst acting as media for the edicts of a pastoral form of government. Everyone is conditioned to face the same direction, directed to breathe in unison through chanting, and encouraged to attend incorporeal supervising powers that transcend the material realm. While a direct comparison to Castell's assessment of the network society grossly misrepresents the procession of information systems, of the ethereal, deterritorialized emanations of power in cathedrals and networks, both place kings into history. A similar environmental inducement of physiological response can be found within stadia and arenas. If Jane Jacobs identified the design heuristic of building to human scale, then stadia exist in direct opposition. Beyond a stadium's obvious function to house as many people as possible, the construct itself introduces the uncanny by removing the familiar. You would have difficulty recognizing even your best friend's face across the space between you. This results in an embodied form of crowd-amplified anxiety that when focused upon a field of action creates the sensation of great excitement and meaningful presence. Our embodied response to environment can be explored within a state of nature. According to the Prospect Refuge aesthetic theory of Jay Appleton, a human innately requires a field of view that allows for both opportunity, as located within a large range of distance, and safety, as found within the reassurance of shelter. 
This panorama of mountains in Jasper National Park affects the romantic notion of the sublime, the landscape which lies beyond the threshold of comprehension. Gernot Bohme challenges this aesthetic sensibility with the ecstasies of atmosphere, claiming that environmental atmosphere precedes cognitive discrimination as the primary object of perception, only later made discernible by the analytical processes of subject-object dichotomy. He claims that atmosphere is the common reality of the perceiver and the perceived. Malls perhaps exemplify the behavioral determinism of design intent. To quote John Goss, the shopper is characterized as an object to be mechanistically manipulated, to be drawn, pulled, pushed, and led to flow towards magnets, anchors, generators, and attractions, or as a naive dope, to be deceived, persuaded, induced, tempted, and seduced by ploys, ruses, tricks, strategies, and games of the design. The environmental saturation of the automobile has drastically altered the notion of human scale. In many areas, especially in North America, the car has supplanted the human, becoming the base unit of surveying spatial measurement. Demarath and Levina recognize this in the banality of design present in strip malls, stating that spaces designed to attract shoppers off the roads paradoxically lack the environmental complexity needed to support pedestrian activity. They determine this is a function of relative velocity. An environment comfortably stimulating from a car becomes monotonously boring on foot, while what is interesting on foot becomes chaotic in a car. The two environments need to be quite different in terms of noticeable differences and perceptual organization. At high speeds, one needs distant views, simplicity, and large scale, while at slow speeds, one needs small scale, intricacy, and complexity. As this clip demonstrates, cars are sociofugal. This savanna of parking lots seems perilous to navigate on foot. Having examined several informal everyday expressions of how architecture comports the human towards performing desired behaviors, perhaps we should now visit how the human can respond. To perform a gruesome reduction of Foucault's theory of power knowledge, we locate the human in an environment of embedded power. In discourse, either with cultural artifacts or with another, the human negotiates the creation of subjective reality, positioning him or herself somewhere within the production of knowledge. Knowledge is the generation of truth, and truth is the claim of authority. As one might imagine, discourse with a building is generally a lopsided exchange. Short of its own physical reconfiguration, the interaction with a building performs a disciplining function across the human body. Freedom to perform is dictated by socially standardized conventions of use. French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu offers a clue in his concept of habitus. He claims that it is the body which shapes the mind, and thus through bodies that resistance is formed. As individuals move through physical spaces, perform socially prescribed practices within these spaces, and interact with others in socially constructed non-physical spaces, this results in a series of postures, gestures, patterns of movement that are prescribed by these spaces, and that imprint themselves as somatic memories on the body. Habitus, the conditioned inhibition of a lived imagination, results. Perhaps this upends the notion of psychosomatic inducement, becoming instead soma psychotic. Jason Kosnowski identifies embodied resistance through the emancipating practice of rambling through a park. He claims that reclamations of power take the form of practices that creatively reinterpret the local places and landscapes that mold action, gesture, and somatic perception. Agency is restored through rupturing habitus. Take, for example, the space between these two school buildings. While basically an interstitial area intended for service vehicles, Daily, this space is reimagined as a de facto quad and agora. This car park becomes a repurposed place for politics. Loren Demarath and David Levenger extend this practice of embodied reclamation to a realm constitutive of a radical conception of the public sphere. 
Their theory contends that pedestrian activities are the creative act of citizenry. They develop the notion that culture places everyday interactions at the center of consideration, arguing that it is during these interactions that a culture's meanings are maintained, innovated upon, or changed. This process of meaning generation is constructed through articulation, understood through typification, and amplified or reconstituted through orientation. Demarath and Levenger identify four creative performances of pedestrianism that act to formulate knowledge. Breadth of experience, identity expression, pausability, and collaborative creativity. It seems that we are compelled to engage in an environment already turgid with power by the time we arrive. Castells contends that this political territory is sublimated by the network, yet assures us that the space of places continues to be the predominant space of experience, of everyday life, and of social and political control. However, short of constructing our own utopias, we are reminded that we are territories in and of ourselves. While our knowledge is the embodied operation of discipline, it can become reconditioned through the consistent reinterpretation of how we engage with the environment, by puncturing the habitus. We can perform this by simply going to the park.